What up, what up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Heart of a Lion podcast. I am your host, Jay, and you have just stepped into the Lion's Den. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, then go ahead and hit that follow or the subscribe button from wherever you're listening to the podcast, as well as to follow the page on Instagram at H-O-A-L podcast. Again, that's at H-O-A-L podcast. Now, if you're a returning listener, then thank you for tuning in again. Thank you for coming back for some more. The support is always appreciated. Um, for anybody who tunes in, listen, Go ahead and share this episode now. Every share, every like, every follow, every subscription helps the podcast to be pushed out to more and more people who will enjoy it just like yourself. Now, today is a special episode for me because, yes, I've had other guests, but today's episode, I have my sister, my blood sister uh, on this podcast, and I'm just super, super, super excited to have her on. Michelle, welcome on to today's episode. Thank you, Broham. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, before we get into the episode, I, as always, I have the guest do the honors of introducing a person that they find that is inspirational to them or a person that they follow because they're creative or whatever. So who is one person that you follow or that you listen to that you feel like other people should follow or listen to? You know, when you told me that you were going to ask this question, I started thinking about it. And initially, I thought about a few women like Christine Kane, Jada Edwards, and Nona Jones, who are amazing women of God and pastors in their own right, I feel. Yet, I don't know that they'd be classified as creatives. I could be wrong, but I just didn't necessarily think they'd be creatives. And I know you only said one, but I thought of those three. But then after thinking about it, I realized that the creative that I feel people should know is you, as cheesy as that may be. But not only are you one of the best big brothers a girl could ask for, I know I tell you that all the time, but you're a man who genuinely loves God and his family. You're a man of integrity who also practices what he preaches. You make time for other people by checking in with everyone in your life to see how they're doing. And you're always ready for prayer. I mean, for me, and I'm sure it's with everybody, I could be in the middle of complaining about something or telling you about what I'm going through. And then a second later, we're in the midst of prayer. Sometimes I'm like, how do we even get here? But it's a reminder (laughs) that (laughs) you're listening to me and then reminding me that we still need to end in prayer because as big of a problem as it may be, or a situation might be, we can still go to God in it and realize that he's even bigger than that. So there's so much more that I could say, but I just thank God for your life. And I hope everyone comes to know the man, the husband, father, son, brother, uncle, cousin, friend, and creative that God has created you to be. Well, wow. Um, (laughs) I'm... I'm truly speechless. I'm truly at a loss for words. I I wasn't sure where you're about to go. I thought you were about to say like a different person. (laughs) Um, All I can say is is that I'm honored that you would say that. And thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. And I don't know what else to say because I, you know, for some reason, like, I don't know, maybe it's the air in here, but my eyes feel like they're watering up a little bit. So we're just going to keep (laughs) keep moving forward. You love your sister. (laughs) But thank you. No, truly, truly. I I really do appreciate that. Um, And I could say more, but today's episode is really about you. So um, the first question I want to ask you, um, what is your earliest memory of us from childhood? Gosh, I feel like when we were in middle school, maybe in living in Pinewood Lakes, I don't have many memories of us in elementary school, let alone remember the names of our elementary schools outside of us going to the pool in Rolling Hills, maybe. But my earliest memory, I feel like, is always Pinewood Lakes and the friends that we would hang out with there. I know your memory goes back way further, but I just don't remember much, I feel. My goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay. So a memory, memories that I have, one memory that I have is that from, so 
so we used to have a home video and this home video was so old that it was on beta tape. And if you don't know what beta tape is, you should Google it. And that's not for you. That's for the listeners. <laughs> but um, I need to it, Google it, too, I think. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a it was a home video from your second birthday party. And we were at grandpa's house. And I just remember seeing, first of all, this is how I know you've been spoiled all your life because it was really? your second. <laughs> It was your second birthday party and you were somebody was holding you and you were just stretched out with your arms back and just enjoying being held. (laughs) And me on the other end, I was everywhere causing havoc, just (laughs) just being as wild as I wanted to be. Well, I will say I always tell people that I was spoiled, but I'm not a spoiled brat. This is true. You were spoiled because growing up. So for people that don't know, there are six of us total, um, but there were four of us that grew up together. My um, my mom and my dad, you know, had the four of us together. Um, And then my dad, our dad has uh, two from before he met my met our mom. But of the four of us who lived together, you were the only girl. So that's the reason why you were spoiled. But you're right. You were not a spoiled brat. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, I, I give you crap all the time about being spoiled, but you were not a spoiled brat. Yes. Um, I'm trying to think what other memories do, do I have? I think that's just my earliest one. Um, but OK, so let's go a little further along because you said your earliest memory is from Pinewood. So when we moved to Pinewood, I was in ninth grade. You were in seventh grade. Um, and yes, we made friends um, throughout the neighborhood. But once you actually got to high school with me, like that's when things begin to change. And I don't know why they changed for us, but that is when they began to change. And you were like the super, super, super popular kid. And I was on the opposite end of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just I was not popular and I don't know why, but for whatever reason, like we just weren't on the same page in high school. Like we could walk past each other and just not say anything. And people mm-hmm. just like if you didn't know us, you wouldn't know that we were related. Um, right. And I can't remember why that was, but I do remember some key moments. Um, there was actually even a moment. I don't know if you remember this um, where I cussed you out in front of other people and I'm not saying that I was right um, but, and the reason why I did it, the reason why I did it was because I'll leave their names out but my one, my best friend in high school um, I used to see him and his sister go back and forth cussing each other out all the time and it was just normal for them and then the one time I did it uh, all your friends jumped on me for doing that. And then afterwards, I like, I legit felt bad. I was like, why would I do that? Like, why do people think that that's okay to talk to their siblings like that? Like to me, like they, that's just uncalled for. Like it's, it's rude and it's uncalled for. Mm-hmm. And um, I think we reconciled over you braiding my hair. Um, which, so. Yeah. Cause that was the most often we talked was when you used to braid my hair. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it was another incident when I was a senior where there was an individual where him and I had gotten into it. And um, essentially, because him and I had gotten into it, there were other people who he was close with who essentially said that they were they were threatening to beat me up when they saw me. And I just like I had the mindset like it is what it is. Um, but you actually went up to the guy. I don't know if you remember this, but you actually went up to the guy. But I, I take that back. He came up to you and tried to give you a hug. And you told him, like, don't like, don't touch me. Like you out here tripping and you got people out here trying to uh, fight my brother and beat up my brother because of what you because of what you did. And you know that you're wrong. And like that same day, like he came up to me and apologized and said that like, he was over it um, and that like, he was wrong. Da, 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 da. Do you remember this? I don't. Dang, your memory, you really don't remember anything. I know, it's so bad. (laughs) Wow, okay, well, yes. I do remember us not being close in high school, though. And it's funny because I wouldn't consider myself popular. Maybe I just knew more people than you did, but I know that we would walk past each other and wouldn't really acknowledge each other in high school for whatever reason. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this. Maybe you weren't popular, but you seem to have a lot of friends. Okay, Whereas yeah. I I knew who everybody was, but I didn't talk to a lot of people. 
Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, cool. So as we so around the time or shortly after I graduated, you went from being somebody who I looked at as like a popular girl, but then um or as you said, like you maybe you just talked to a lot of people, you had a lot of friends to somebody who was more isolated and didn't really have a lot of friends. Like what happened with that? Because I, I, right. I don't know that I ever like really remember what happened or really remember what happened. Um, but yeah, what was it? What happened with that? And how was that transition for you? Yeah, I can't remember the exact scenario, of course, because, you know, my memory is pretty bad, but. I do know I had a falling out with the majority of my closest friends. I don't know if it was something I said, something I did, or maybe even because of my relationship at the time, but there was a falling out where they were still a group of friends. And then it felt like it was just me on an island by myself. But I guess even going back to high school, starting out, I had a group of friends, but I had a bad attitude and I didn't really apply myself. Like I'll admit to that. Um, If there was something I didn't understand, I just was unmotivated, would not apply myself because I always remember algebra class in ninth grade, I think it was with Mr. Narkowitz. And I did not understand his concepts or whatever he was trying to teach us. So I would sleep through it. And I think I was even sitting in the front of the class. I would sleep through class. I was just unwilling to take the time to learn anything he was trying to teach us. And through that, I don't know if people started talking to me because I had this, I don't care mentality. I'll do what I want. Um, And then other people, I'm sure, probably thought I was dumb. But that's how I was for a good portion of ninth and 10th grade, maybe, where I just had this unmotivated, bad attitude where I just really didn't care. Um, And even during that time, I was smoking, I was stealing, um, drinking, not heavily, but I was drinking at the time. And then it had to be in either ninth or 10th grade where I got caught stealing at AJ Wright on Richmond Highway. It's been forever since they kind of switched up that store, but I would have gotten away with it had I not turned around and walked back into the store when the security guard had come out and asked one of my friends and I to come back in at the time. I didn't realize it was because they saw us stealing on the cameras. Now thinking back, I'm like, we should have just ran. But I remember going back into the back room and them telling us that we had to call our parents or our guardian. And I was hoping that mommy was available because I knew that I could talk to her a little bit easier than I could talk to daddy. But unfortunately, daddy was the only one um, available. And so he had to come pick me up and I'll never forget what he said because it has stuck with me all these years. I thought he was going to yell. I thought he was going to whoop me in front of everybody, even though he didn't hit me um, ever, really. But he said something like, did you need that so bad that I couldn't provide it for you? Something along those lines. And that cut really deep because in that moment, I realized I didn't need anything that bad. So I would have just preferred the whooping because I was expecting it and feel like I could live with that temporary pain. Um, But then he brought me home and he told mommy that she had to deal with me. And again, I was expecting to get whooped because that definitely was her thing. (laughs) But they were both just so disappointed with me that I don't even think they could bring themselves to whoop me. All they could do was just kind of look at me in disgust. That's how I felt. Um, So I didn't get the whooping, but I could definitely tell that they were extremely disappointed in me. And I was on punishment for a month. I'll never forget that because I couldn't do anything. You don't remember that? I'm just, first of all, I'm like, that's it? Like, that's all you got was a month? (laughs) That was a long time. (laughs) I got got in trouble for less. It was like on punishment for like two and three months. (laughs) 
had like no TV, no phone, no house phone that is because I don't know that we had cell phones around that time, but I couldn't do anything except schoolwork pretty much. So I don't know if you remember, but that was the time that I got straight A's almost. I had all A's and one B plus, and it was because of that one month that I was on punishment. But I say that because I feel like that was the start of a shift for me and I don't know that it necessarily contributed to the fallout that I had with my close friends at the time, but I know that I was starting to shift my behavior and my mentality in general. And interesting. Yeah. You see, it's interesting because I, I guess because we were so distant, even though we lived in the same house in high school, I thought that you always got good grades. You know, I thought that, yeah, because that this is my thought because my grades in high school had gotten to a point where they were so bad that and yours were so good that I used to hide my report card because I didn't want to <laughs> I didn't want them asking me or I didn't want them seeing what my grades were because it was like these things are terrible I got you weren't applying yourself I really wasn't applying myself um but that so it's just so interesting that I just I just never knew this side I, I didn't know this yeah even the, the drinking and the smoking, I used to, I didn't know that you did it to an, to a certain extent, but I also hated that you did it, but I knew I couldn't control you either. Right. And I was sharing this story with someone recently and they asked me if I felt peer pressure to smoke or steal or do anything like that. And I really didn't. I don't know that I've ever felt peer pressure to do anything I didn't want to do. I feel like I've always had a mind of my own because, you know, mommy would drill into us that we need to be leaders and not followers. And I never forgot that. Um, Of course, I understand that you have to learn to follow in order to lead, but I knew what she meant. It was essentially not to allow someone to convince you to do something you didn't want to do. But again, that experience for me was a mile marker in my life when I look back. I'm just learning that we all have mile markers in our lives where events or experiences change us, whether good or bad. And there may be a change in behavior, a change in mindset, for example, but there's definitely a shift. So like I said, getting caught stealing and the events that followed definitely changed me. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I remember, I mean, I don't remember everything, but I remember, <laughs> I remember a time when, you, I guess on the earlier side of high school, there was a time, do you remember when y'all used to call yourselves um, the, the, the Suttas and Highway Honeys and all that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I remember it was a time when y'all was in the neighborhood and I. it was a, it was like, I don't know, it was like six or seven of y'all at this one particular moment and you had your hat on sideways and at first of all, it wasn't in your hat, but you had a hat on sideways. I'm like, what are y'all doing? Where are y'all about to go? And like, yeah, yeah, we about to go fight so and so in the other neighborhood. Da 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 da. I'm like, what do you think you're doing? Like, this isn't even you. And exactly. like, nah, we just gotta go handle our business. And I'm like, you don't have any business. Like, what you- <laughs> it's so funny thinking about it. I'm just like, this is ridiculous. I was like, I again, I can't control her, but I I need you to know how I feel in this moment. <laughs> um, but you went from that. To not to say that you were ever a tomboy, but you weren't, but just seeing like the way you, I guess the way you carried yourself in school, but also the way you like, not just with your grades, but the way you carried yourself, it was like, you seem to get more into fashion and, mm-hmm. and, um, not that you, again, not that you never cared about what you want, uh, what you wore, but just, you carried yourself very differently. Yeah. Um, and, um, so yeah, so then I graduate and, you know, you have your falling out and different things like that. And I had started going to church and um, you had really angered it in school. And I'm going to fast forward to come back. And um, you had um, actually started coming with me to church before you before you graduated high school and went off to right. college. And I graduated 04. You graduated 06. I had gone to a retreat in 2012 and. At, the, at this retreat, they surprised us by having people that we know had we, or we found out that people that we know had written us letters and sent us letters to this retreat. And one of the letters that was that I read was from you. And you essentially were telling me, 
like how you came to Christ. And I just remember like being floored because I I didn't know any of this. But I would love for you to share now how you went from being the from being the, the person who had all the friends to being a person who was isolated to, to coming to Jesus. Like, tell us that story. Yeah. So it was around that time where I felt like I was on an island by myself. I remember even being at school, just avoiding lunch in the cafeteria and either eating lunch in the locker bank or in the reception area of the office by the locker bank, because I just wanted to avoid everyone. And at that time, I was feeling very alone, lost and confused and thought that everyone would just be better off if I weren't around. And I was really good at wearing a mask, especially in front of my family and making it think that I was okay when really I was struggling. And around that time, you were going to church pretty regularly and I'm sure had already joined the choir and everything at that time. And I remember initially thinking that's just something he does with his friends. I don't want to be involved, but I feel like you would always invite us to church because there would be certain events that you would participate in. And one day I went and of course I was in that really dark place. And I don't think it was the first time, but I feel like I definitely belonged there and eventually accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Mm. So for you, what do you think it was like? I know you said that you had gone a couple of times. Was it just one day it clicked? But like, how did you go from like that, from being in that really dark place where you feel like I just want to end my life to I accept Jesus and I love life now? I think it was continuing to go, listening to the words of the songs that the choir was singing, the words that the preacher was preaching, and not just being there, if that makes sense. Because Mm -hmm. for me, I realized that even though I was in a dark place, God is the light in darkness. And even though I was feeling alone, really, he's always with me. So it's almost like thinking about God's promises and what he says in his word about us and realizing that what I think about myself or what other people might think about me is really insignificant. So that changed me. And then I think I started going once and kept going every Sunday and maybe even Wednesday thereafter. It's so it's so crazy because, again, like when I when I read it, you know, it, I was just floored. And then the way you wrote it in the letter, I know you said you don't, when we talked about it the other day, you said you didn't remember the letter, but like the way you wrote it in the letter, was like, you contemplated suicide. And like, just, just seeing that on paper or hearing those words come out of somebody's mouth, it's like, it like my, like, I, 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 I don't know how to say it. Like my, I won't say like my stomach sank or like whatever, like whatever the term is, but I was just like floored, like, Wow. And what that really showed me is how important it is for us to model our walk with Christ, because you really never know who is watching you. And, you know, I don't think that I was perfect by any means at all. And it's it's interesting because you said that, like, you really were affected by the words. I know for me, like I was just singing words like I did. I, it wasn't until years later for me where I really was impacted by the words of the songs, but still like you seeing me go had an impact on you. And it just, I I used to wonder around that time after reading your letter, like what if I never went to church or what if I, Mm -hmm. you know, what if I never took it seriously? Like would I still have a sister today? You know, what could I have done differently? Like these are all the different things that used to go through my head around that time. And it just, Yeah, I was just at a loss for words. No, that's true. And I think when it comes to like words impacting how you feel or maybe even someone accepting Christ into their lives, it depends on what they're going through and how it would hit them at that moment. But I agree, we do have to model our walk with Christ and realize that you never really know who's watching you. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, you never really know who's going through what. Exactly. 
because like you said, I mean, you were, were good at wearing a mask. You know, none of us, I mean, none of us knew that at home, but I also think that because, I mean, <laughs> nobody has the perfect childhood, right? But mm-hmm. I think because of everything that we had going on at home, everybody, even though we were all in the house together, it was like everybody was living their own individual life. Right. And I think thinking back to that now, and also even in this current season of my life, like we've talked about many times, it's so important to have community around you because when you're feeling isolated or you're feeling alone, God only knows what you're capable of. But that's why he calls us into community and into fellowship. So if there is someone struggling, I would say reach out to, lean on your family, your friends, your colleagues, and talk to them, ask them for help. Mm. So can we talk about the community piece? And I, I say that from a standpoint of like, I know that um, you, you were going to a particular church and then um, you kind of got away from it. I think part of it was because of distance, but two also um, just because like you weren't really into that church anymore. So you started watching church online. And for a long time, you were just doing church online. So from going from church online to recently um, going back to church in person, like how has that made a difference in your life? I think outside of being able to reach out and talk to people, it's accountability too. So having people to hold you accountable, expect you to be there, to have responsibility at church, I think is very important. Because when you're at home, sure, you can watch church. Um, You may get a lot from the word, but then you just go on to doing the next thing oftentimes. Instead of being in community the way God has called us to, because he doesn't call us to live alone. We're supposed to live in community, model our walk with Christ so that other people might see who don't know him and come to believe. Nobody can come to believe if we're just sitting at home all the time. (laughs) That is so true. Which is what I prefer to do, but learning that it's not going to (laughs) work. And it's so it's so funny. Just again, just looking back, because I I would say now you're I don't want to say you're a loner, but you enjoy your solitude, you know, and I'm the one who has like a a lot of friends or a lot of people I hang out with. And on the other like 20 years ago, I was the one who preferred to be in solitude and you were the one who had all these friends. Mm hmm. But, you know, it just goes to show how we can, how we grow, how we change, how personalities just change over time. But um, I mean, even speaking to that piece, because like there are people who I know who do just prefer to to be in solitude or they so say, well, I have my own relationship with God or, you know, I can talk to God in my own ways or I don't need community this and third. But at the same time, like that really goes against the Bible, because not to say that you can't cultivate the space for God to be there, but it also says where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. So, right. you know, it's just. And that's not to say that you can't have that solitude, but of course we need our alone time with God. At the same time, he also calls us to be in community. So even with my introverted self, as much as I would prefer to be in the house and keep God all to myself, that's not what he calls us to do. It's to be in community so that we can bring in unbelievers so that they might come to believe again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like you said before, it's like we can't you can to model our walk with Christ. That means we have to be out amongst the people like there's nothing to right. model. Like, I don't know any model who just stayed in the house all the time and got discovered, you know, in that same way. Right. Like in order for us to model that walk, like we have to be out and like modeling it, like people will see you model your walk by the by the things that you face and deal with every day. You know, how are you with your family? How are you with people who are difficult? How are you with your coworkers? How are you in different scenarios and different situations and your your high moments and your low moments? Like this is how people like this is how people truly see what your character is and, and who you are as a person. Right. And I think another point in modeling the, the walk with Christ is realizing that it doesn't mean everything will be perfect or everything is going to go according to your plan or everything is going to be all good. No, 
God never promised that it would be easy. We're definitely going to have hard experiences, hard moments. And as much as we hate those, it's really how we grow and evolve and just become more like Christ. That's something I'm learning to accept even in my own life. Yeah. Yeah. I know um, there's a, a Christian hip hop artist who said in a song years ago, he said, my my worst day as a believer is better than my best. My, he said, my worst day as a believer is better than my best day before I met Christ. And mm-hmm. like that has just stuck with me because it's like, like you say, like we can we go through so much or we can go through so much. But going through life with God is far better than going through it without him. Yes. I mean, even in my own walk, I'm just reminding myself constantly that I'm nothing apart from God. When I feel like I'm distanced from God, I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about what I'm doing, but learning to seek him in everything and seek him first, that is, in everything. Mm. Amen. Amen. So if you could... If you could have a conversation with your younger self or have a conversation with somebody who went through what you went through or is going through what you went through, like, what would you say to that person? Or what would you say to your younger self? Gosh, so much. But I think the first thing would be that you will be all right. When you're in those hard moments, it's so easy to feel like, you're the only one going through it. But I know now we go through things not only for ourselves, but also that we can share our experiences and help somebody else who will likely go through the same thing or who is going through the same thing at that moment. So the first thing I would tell my younger self is you'll be all right. You're much stronger than you think. And trust God, seek him in everything. And he'll pull you through to the other side. Hmm. Amen. Amen. I feel like you're uh, a silent warrior in the sense that you you historically, I won't say currently, because I think you're doing much better currently, <laughs> historically <laughs> had gone through so much, but didn't talk about a lot that you were going through with a lot that you went through. Um. But to even know you in this current season and so much that you have dealt with, yet you still continue to push through and are managing yourself well. Well, managing yourself well because you're allowing God into the situation, but just to see how strong you are, how resilient you are. Um, You talk about the community piece, like the community piece that, that you have around you, like just you're that silent warrior, but again, you're not just strong in your spiritual life, but just strong in your natural life. Like you're like, you are definitely someone like a young woman could aspire to be just like, like you're, you are really about your business. (laughs) You are really about your business. (laughs) You know, when it, when it comes to work, you know, like you don't play like people like, like you, you are not afraid to tell people how you feel. And (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I, but I really, I really appreciate that about you. I thank you for that. And again, as you know, in this current season, and it's a difficult one, I'm not even going to lie, you know that, but I realized that when I go through things, my natural instinct is to isolate myself. I go all the way back to where I was in high school. But again, I'm learning that We need community. God does not call us to live life alone. So I need to lean on my family, my very close friends who have been there in ways I cannot even imagine. But God gets all the glory for who I am today and the resiliency that you think I have, the strength that I have. God gets all the glory for that because I would not have it without him. And I'm also reading this book, Inside Out, by Dr. Larry Crabb. And it essentially talks about how we truly change from the inside out. But one of the main points in the book is how we often have a self-protective nature and how we live and go about life protecting ourselves from 
unwanted hurt and pain. So I'm thinking about that in all of my interactions because, again, my natural instinct is to isolate because I don't want to feel like I'm a burden to somebody else or to avoid talking to people, let's say, at work or when I'm out because I don't want to feel like they'll eventually hurt me or say something that would cause me pain. But we have to be open again so that people can learn from our hardships, our experiences, model that walk with Christ so that they can come to know him for themselves. Mm. Amen. So what would you say? You can either answer this in one part or in two parts um, or answer part of the question or both parts of the question. What would you say is your greatest lesson learned in this season? And what is your greatest lesson learned in life? I think it goes back to what I've been saying, and that's that God hasn't called us to live life alone. I've said that quite a bit, but it's such an important important reminder for me because, like I said, when I'm going through something, my natural instinct is to isolate and put on that mask so that people don't realize how much I'm hurt or I'm struggling. But I realize that I need to be open. I need to be in community so that for all of the people that I've been there for, that they can finally be able to be there for me like they want to, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy too, because I've even seen how, <laughs> even even through your own difficult situations, the Lord has used you to be with other women and encourage other women and empower other women through their own situations. And it's just, Again, it's just amazing for me to sit back and watch how God is using you in your current season. And it just goes to show like that God can use you even in the midst of your own pain. You know, God yes. can use you um, in your mountain highs or your valley lows. But you have but we as people have to be open and receptive to being used, you know, because it's 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 so easy to isolate when you're going through something. I don't want to talk to nobody. I want to be around nobody. I don't want to be bothered, whatever. But like when you still do community, when you still do life and, and the Lord still uses you in the midst of whatever you're going through, it's just it's so amazing to see. And I think that's a good point, too. Oftentimes we feel like, oh, once I get to this point, then I can allow God to use me. Or once I'm here, then he can use me. But really, he can use you where you are right now. The here and now is what he can use. So don't feel like you have to wait until you're in a specific spot or with a specific person in a specific place. He can use you right where you are. Yeah. And even to that point, it's like when it's like people who say um, people who say, you know, I got to get my life right before I go to church. I like, I don't know anybody who got their life right before they went to church. Like I go to church right. to get my, to get my life right. That's like saying I have to get healthy before I go see the doctor. Like, no, the point of you going to the doctor so you can figure out what's going on. Yeah. Or people trying to find a perfect church, right? It becomes imperfect the moment we walk in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and so I hear so many people say that they have to find like they're looking for a church. But most of the people I, I hear say they're looking for a church ain't got out the house to, to find it. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm looking for a church. I'm looking for a church. Da, 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 da. I was like, oh, have you which one did you go to this past Sunday? Oh, I ain't go. Which one you went to this, this coming Sunday? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Like, are you really are you truly seeking a church home or are you just making excuses? Right, because there's action that's required on our part. We can't just sit around and expect things to happen. We have to take action ourselves, too. Yeah, for sure. I don't know what that uh, was that trash truck on your end. <laughs> oh, you hear that? <laughs> it was the trash truck. Yes. OK. I was like, what in the world is going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. trash. Truck. Gotcha. 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 OK, well. And then I forgot the second part of your question. But. Oh, I said, what the greatest lesson learned in life and or the greatest lesson learned in this season, and the greatest lesson learned in life. Mm -hmm. There's still so much more life to live. Yeah.
But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've realized that God always puts me into positions and makes me do things that I would ordinarily not want to do. For example, even for work, I hate speaking in front of people, but I'm required to as part of my job. And thanks be to God, I'm always able to get through it. But he always calls the most unlikeliest people to the most unlikeliest places to do the unlikeliest things. And that's just how God is. I love him so much for that. The crazy thing to me is like you, you speak very well too. Like you, you speak very, very well. (laughs) Thanks be to God. Like I said, because I hate it, but it's what he calls me to do, which again, whenever he calls you to do something, he's not just going to leave you there to fail. So I thank him for that. Yeah. I also thank him for using our mama, even though she ain't know it. Cause I, I don't know if you remember like when we were kids, she used to have us doing hooked on phonics and we had the tapes called You Can Read. You're like, you can read, you can read. Yes, I remember that hooked on phonics. Yeah. And it's like we couldn't tell people at school because you used to get, you know, people would joke on you if you were hooked on phonics or joke on you if you were doing stuff like that. Like, which looking back on it, like, why were we getting joked on? Because like you need to know how to read. But I think that those things like really helped us and shape us and like to really not just read and write, but also be able to articulate our words. And um, she was really, really good with that. Yeah, she was. Even in the way that we spoke, that was Grammy, too. Yeah. She wouldn't let us talk crazy. Yeah. (laughs) She was like, pronunciate your words. She would correct us if we spelled it wrong on paper. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that definitely helped. Yeah, man. It's it's crazy because it seemed like it was I mean, it was a long time ago, but it it, like just some of those memories just come back like they were yesterday. They do. Thanks to you, because I couldn't remember some of them. (laughs) (laughs) Do you remember um, when we used to play Uno with Grandma? I remember Uno. We used to play Uno. That was our game. Yes, but how the games used to go? No. So we would play Uno with Grandma. Grandma would go, it would be my turn, it'd be your turn, it'd be her turn, and she'd sleep. (laughs) (laughs) She's always been like that. I know, I'm just saying, like, it's only three of us playing. Drop of a hat, yeah. It's it's only three of us playing, and she just. But no, but to, in fairness, grandma used to get up at 5 a.m. every morning and go to bed at 11 o'clock every night. So it's like if she mm-hmm. could get a nap in whenever she was going to take that nap, even when she didn't realize she was going to take that nap. Yes. And one thing I can say is we have a praying grandmother because I remember seeing her on her knees in the morning praying. And honestly, I often feel like if it wasn't for the prayers of our praying grandmother, I don't know where. Oh, I'll say specifically me, but I don't know where we would be. No, it's true. You know, because we weren't active in church growing up. But grandma, mm-hmm. she always prayed for us. And again, like if I don't if it wasn't for her prayers, I, I genuinely don't know where I would have been. And then it's like, if I don't know where I would have been, I don't know where you all would have been. Because, you know, right. I, I was in church and then you came to church and then Brandon came to church and then daddy came. Like, so it's like, I like it's like. It's a it's a it's a domino, a ripple effect. Right. And I think back to that quite a bit when I thank God for your life, because I feel like you set the tone for our family. As you said, we didn't necessarily grow up in church. We may have gone for Easter, but we didn't have a church home growing up until you had joined church and set the tone for the rest of us. Mm, No. Thank you, God, for the praying grandmother. Thank you, God, for the tug on my life and getting me there and for just pulling the rest of us. Right. So I hope this episode blesses even just one person to come to know Christ for themselves because he has changed my life for the better. I know that he's changed your life. And I will say things will not always be easy. They will get hard but he's right there with you every step of the way. He has reminded me time and time again that you can have joy in the midst of sorrow. 
and if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, he will blow your mind. Mm. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I literally can't add anything to that. So amen. Um, normally, well, Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Normally what I do at the end of every episode is I'll tell people where to follow somebody, but you don't have social media. You're not on social media. You don't care to be on social media. So no, I've been thinking about it though. We'll see if it changes. Okay. Well, in the meantime, if you all would love to hear more from, from Michelle, then just let me know and I'll get her back on a future episode. Um, (laughs) But I appreciate you for coming on. I I thank you for taking this trip back, back down memory lane. I thank you for, sharing your testimony and um, just taking time out of your day. I thank you, my dear sister. Thanks for having me. And also thinking of me to want me to come on. Oh, for sure. I Listen, you have a testimony that needed to be shared. I'm just glad you were willing to share it. Thank you. Yeah. I love you. I'll talk to you later. Until next time, y'all. Love you too. Bye.